degree. So my initial, um, my background is that I'm trained as a pharmacist and went into uh, molecular biology and computational chemistry, um, as you'll hear about in my slides, through the excitement of visualizing 3D protein structures. So I'm going to make a start and um, yeah, I hope you enjoy this and I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you very much, Robert and Nikki for the invitation to give this presentation. So as alluded to, I mentioned uh, I'm a pharmacist by training and a large part of the reason I chose to study pharmacy was because during a psychology class on addiction, I saw an attractive three-dimensional video representation of neurotransmitter molecules, so adrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, acting as chemical messengers via synapses. And for me, this led to a fascination with the way that molecules bind to proteins and send signals. Um, and having the opportunity to three-dimensionally um, study and look at these kinds of interactions uh, was what inspired me to pursue a PhD in computational chemistry, where I studied the beta adrenergic receptor. Um, and I was looking at Again, things like beta blockers binding to the, this particular receptor. Um, and we can see here some sort of visualizations of, of these things that have inspired me. So this sketch and animation was created in the Procreate app on iPad. Uh, and I uh, modeled this human beta adrenergic receptor, creating a Schrodinger's prime homology modeling tool and docked the beta blocker Karazolol here using Glide, a docking program. And in fact, this visualization, this representation was actually inspired by uh, David Goodsell's art back in my first year of my, my postgraduate studies and created in PyMol. So uh, yeah, really excited to be here. And all this to say is to, um, yeah, to say thank you and firsthand that molecular art and visualization can play a huge role in inspiring future and present scientists. So the roadmap for the next 20 minutes for, for my talk, um, I'm gonna first introduce you to Maestro, which is Schrodinger's visualization environment uh, and cover how you can access this. Um, next, I'm gonna demonstrate how to download structures from the protein data bank, which I believe we'll be hearing a little bit more about later, uh, the protein data bank, how to get these structures into Maestro, and I'll also show you how to apply various types of styles in order to visualize your chosen structures, uh, make them look nice. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate a relatively new Schrodinger tool called Ligand Designer, which is um, a way to three-dimensionally build or augment desirable modifications to, to sort of existing ligands. And you can do this kind of via this 3D, 2D hybrid method and really generate some nice um, potential new drug molecules. Uh, it's my understanding that we have quite a broad audience here, so I expect that there'll be a little bit of something for everybody uh, with, with how I've pitched this, but feel free to add questions to the chat and also I'll be around for the Q&A session later. So uh, let's get started with how to access Maestro. So firstly, for the Columbia students and faculty, you can download Maestro by um, following the instructions on the Columbia University Libraries page. And for those joining outside of Columbia, we offer a free uh, version of Maestro to academic users, which can be accessed via schrodinger.com slash academic licensing. In both cases, you'll register for a free Schrodinger web account and receive a confirmation email, which will enable you to download the software. Um, for further inquiries or for commercial use, please see the website, which is schrodinger.com, or feel free to contact our sales team, which is just sales at schrodinger.com. So now I'm going to switch over to Maestro and uh, give you a demonstration. I'll show you how to import structures from the protein data bank and make them look pretty. Um, so let's have a look. So this is the Maestro interface. In fact, I might just turn my camera off for this for maximum bandwidth, but I will be back. <laughs> 
So this is the Maestro interface. Uh, we're going to be importing some proteins from the protein data bank. So let's start by coming up to file here and saying get PDB. And then we get this pop-up dialog box uh, where we can type in the four letter code from the protein data bank entry. So in this case, I'm going to import the five IE uh, Y structure, which is an, um, Inhib which is an inhibitor molecule bound to a cyclin dependent kinase CDK2 uh, protein. So we can simply click on download and the uh, protein data bank entry will appear in our workspace. And there are many different ways that we can move things around in Maestro and that the mouse can kind of interact and help us to, to visualize uh, this protein. So, just to show you quickly, we can actually customize the way that we do this. For example, if you have a trackpad, uh, you might want to actually set this to trackpad mode and it will tell you the commands, for example, for zooming, for rotating your structure, for translating it, so moving it from side to side. Um, and again, if you're familiar with using Pymol, you might want to have the same mouse actions that you're already used to for navigating in that three-dimensional workspace. So again, you can set your, uh, your navigation and the way that you interact with this um, based on your preferences and customize it as much as you want. So I'm going to use the default, stick with the default, which is the three button and scroll wheel option. So again, I can just scroll in and out to zoom in and out on this structure. I can move it side by side and I can rotate it around. So there's a few different options there. Um, if you somehow lose where your structure is, uh, so for example, you zoom out an awful lot and you can't see it. We also have these kind of fit to view options up here. So you can click on this uh, fit all atoms to the workspace option and it will bring everything into view. Um, and you can also, zoom in on things like the ligand here which is denoted by the little l in a box or if for example you have a single atom selected you can use this little uh, zoom selector here just to zoom on a very specific place within your structure so hopefully this will give you a bit of an idea of how to navigate move things around within maestro and it's important to be aware that um, within maestro it, we work on a select first paradigm. So items within the workspace need to be selected in order for us to then modify them. So what I'm going to do is select just the ligand here. Um, in this case, we can do this by clicking on this little quick select menu, the P for protein here, L for ligand, S for solvent molecules. So if we click on the ligand, we can see that the ligand atoms are highlighted now. And what we might want to do is make this ligand look a little bit more distinct from the rest of the protein. So we can come up to the style toolbox here, just this little style icon, and look at, say, the thickness. And we can increase the thickness there and say, oh, actually, maybe we want sort of some balls and sticks or a sort of space filling representation of the ligand there um, so that it's it's a little bit more uh, visible and discernible and we can see the difference between the ligand and the protein. We might also want to style our protein to be a little bit more uh, recognizable or a little bit more um, interesting than say just this wireframe um, where we can't really tell where the backbone is, where the chains are and, and how the overall shape of it uh, looks. So we can do this again by just selecting the protein atoms coming up to our style toolbox and choosing ribbons, which is a way of showing uh, the secondary structure of our protein structure. Again, we can color this in different ways. So we can color it specifically by secondary structure. Uh, for example, here we've got the alpha helices in red. We've got some nice beta sheets here as well in this cyan kind of color and the coil that connects them in, uh, in gray here. We can color this uh, also by where it is, so the position. So it will kind of give us a nice spectrum color uh, from sort of red through to blue uh, based on the position. So you can get an idea here that you can really customize things and make things look um, a sort of very specific way based on your preferences. Um, so 
The next thing I can I'm going to show you is how to apply a surface. So again, I'm going to make sure just to select the protein. We don't want the ligand to be part of this molecular surface. So we're just going to click on the style toolbox again and click on the surface option. And now we've got this nice looking sort of blob, which is perhaps again a little bit more characteristic if you're used to seeing proteins in this kind of form or visualizing them in this way. And again, we can click on our ligand and say maybe we would like to have a, a thinner representation of that so we can see it again nicely nestled into that receptor ligand binding pocket there. So that's how we've used the style uh, toolbox to customize some of our, uh, our, our uh, displays. We can also color the actual surface uh, the little S next to the entry that's selected here. We can manage the surfaces, choose from the display options and choose different properties. So again, for example, we can choose things like the residue position, um, which will color it by spectrum, the residue property, um, whether it's hydrophobic, hydrophilic, that kind of thing, uh, the element type. So again, things like oxygens, nitrogens and things will be colored. Um, or we can hide or delete the surface as well if we don't want to see it anymore. So we can just say hide all. So um, there's again, there's quite a lot that I've shown you there just from this style toolbox. But a really nice way that we can look at things is via using presets. And this is basically like a rendering recipe for your molecules where different representations um, are added and mixed in to make a nicely rendered structure. So we'll start off with this simple representation, which just shows a protein back, uh, backbone. We've also got um, ligand uh, boil and stick, which if you've used actual molecular modeling kits, this looks a little bit like what you might build with a molecular modeling kit. Um, and then we've got things like ligand sites where we can actually look at, uh, for example, a solid surface just around the area of the ligand. And we can see here, that there's some water molecules and that the, the binding pocket shape can be seen quite nicely uh, based on the surface just being displayed around this ligand area. So I'm going to show you another structure that I downloaded earlier. This one took a little bit longer to download from the protein data bank because it's quite large. Um, so this is the 6RVW um, structure, which is a protein cage consisting of 24 11 membered ring proteins and they're held together by gold bridges and I've just applied the simple preset here um, and so this is giving this really nice representation and the thing that I wanted to show here um, is that you can alter in Maestro the clipping panes so there's this little toggle menu set down here and if we click on the plus in the bottom right hand corner we can display the clipping planes. And this is a nice visualization tool if you, for example, want to uh, blur out or sharpen the, the kind of the background of the, uh, of the structure. And again, if you want to uh, do the same with the foreground, so we can kind of enter into the molecule here. We're sort of inside this giant cage of proteins, which I think is quite nice. And again, this is really this is really handy if you want to create some some images with sort of a nice level of depth, um, and so you can position things nicely. And the way that you can create images in Maestro is quite straightforward. You, you would just right click um, on an area in the workspace and choose the save image option. You then get some really nice options. So you can choose whether or not you want a transparent background. You can choose your, your DPI, your resolution, customize it. Again, choose the, the um, uh, dimensions of your desired output uh, and again the file type so lots of nice ways to save uh, images create pretty images based on uh, brilliant protein structures so before I move on to the final um, part of the demo I'm just going to bring us back to a structure that I have quite a lot of personal love for which is the beta adrenergic receptor and this is so this is a uh, adrenaline receptor with um, um, an adrenaline ligand bound there or um, co-crystallized into this structure. And what we can do here is show additional 
um, information. For example, how the ligand interacts with the, the protein. So if we do this via the ligand site, we can see actually a little bit more information about the types of uh, interactions that are taking place here. So yes, it looks quite busy, but we've got some dotted lines here, some uh, yellow dotted lines where we're seeing hydrogen bonding between the ligand and the receptor molecules. And another way we can show this in Maestro is via this ligand interaction diagram tool up here, which is in our favorites toolbar. We can click on this tool and it will give us a 2D representation of the, uh, the ligand binding site. Ooh disappeared. Ooh. There we go. And so again, this is a nice way to just display the interactions between uh, a protein molecule and a bound ligand. We can actually sync this with the workspace as well. So if we want to orientate our structure in a certain way, it will sync up um, so that we can see sort of an aligned version between the three-dimensional and the two-dimensional workspace and our molecule. So I'm just gonna move back to the, the slides for a minute now um, before the, the final part of the demonstration, just to say that um, there's a lot of information I've shared there and you're probably thinking, gosh, there's a lot that you can do in Maestro, which is the case. Uh, but a really useful thing to be aware of is that the help menu is actually helpful. So just to go back to Maestro, we've got the help menu up here. You can click on help and you can see a number of different things, tutorials, videos, there's the search function there as well. Uh, and again, what you'll do is if you click on help, it will take you straight to the manual page, the, the, uh, the documentation on our website, which will give you a nice overview of what uh, you can do. So this is really helpful. Again, within a lot of the panels within Maestro, there's a little question mark um, at the bottom right hand corner. And again, you can click on that and it'll take you directly to the documentation page for Maestro, um, which is really, really handy. So the next thing, I'm just gonna move that. Um, that again, I just want to highlight really is our training portal, which can be accessed via the training tab on schrodinger.com. Lots of really useful resources here, um, over 50 free tutorials, videos, webinars, um, and, and content to explore this software. Um, and I'd really like to highlight this Maestro learning series, which again, just is lots of really nice instructional videos on how to use this tool. And if like me, you think it's useful to see how others have used the software, then I'd really recommend checking out the publications page, um, which again, can be used to generate, generate ideas. And this is regularly updated and searchable um, in terms of application or topic. So if there's something particular that you'd like to use, then I'd recommend having a look at the publications. So now we've covered how to get structures into Maestro and have a closer look at the interactions. Um, I'm now going to spend a little bit of time just looking at how we could potentially further design molecules and create brand new molecules within a binding pocket. So this is kind of moving into the realm of medicinal chemistry, lead optimization and drug design. But again, as you'll see, you can right click and save an, an image at any point. So this is still sort of quite nice if you would like to capture any of this in a visual manner. So I'm just gonna come back to the Maestro um, demo screen here. And with this beta adrenergic structure, I'm gonna go to tasks and come to the lead optimization panel and choose ligand designer. And within ligand designer, what we can do is analyze the workspace and ligand designer will kind of use this augmented reality layover, which gives you the opportunity to layer your information. So you're not having this cluttered workspace with all of the protein side chains and all of the potential interactions at once. So what we can see here instead is this, this growth space, this cloudy blue area, which is represented um, by these, yeah, these blue areas. So the pale blue represents space that is buried within the pocket, but space between the ligand and the binding pocket. 
and the blue areas are solvent accessible spaces, so space that's exposed to, uh, to a solvent. And this is really flexible and immersive design environment, so what you can do is choose as a number of different workflows here, um, our group enumeration, but what we're going to do here is actually just choose to fill some of this growth space. So can we expand our chemical compounds by just filling this space? So what you can do is sort of basically click, choose somewhere to click and pick a sphere. Got a little bit of lag. Let's just see if it will pick. I've got the spinning wheel. <laughs> so we can click, we should be able to click anywhere in this space in order to pick a sphere. Uh, and if this doesn't work, I've got some really nice um, demos with, with a little bit more information on the website that will talk you through this process. But basically it enables us to, ah, here we go. We can grow our compound into this space. And then we get this banner at the top that says explore ligand chain um, to fill the growth space. So we can click OK there. And then what will happen is actually there will be uh, an enumeration process whereby all of the potential uh, vectors are then shown. So we can see where on our ligand we can potentially grow this, uh, this molecule. So if we click on this, uh, this first option for now, we can click enumerate and this will generate, we can see here there's 43 new ideas being generated. These are actually automatically being docked using Glide into the binding pocket in order to test whether they will fit and sort of whether there'll be favorable interactions. And what we can do now is look at all these brand new potential entries and visualize them and say, oh, are any of these um, particularly nice? Are they uh, kind of new, new molecules that we might want to um, kind of chemically synthesize or uh, form in terms of um, looking into further? So it's a really nice sort of lead generation tool um, and in lead optimization tool. And again, we can see this, this multi-parameter optimization chart here on the right, which tells us really are any of these properties better or worse than our previous initial starting ligand and, and sort of work our way through the workflow there. So I'm going to I'm going to finish there in terms of the ligand designer demo. As I said, there are some some more extensive demos on the website um, which have a lot more information. And again, there's some really nice training resources as well. So we have a couple of full length tutorials which will guide you step by step through the ligand designer workflow, uh, lead optimization with and without water molecules. Um, again, so I'd really recommend checking those out if you're interested in playing with this tool. So finally, just to finish, um, how am I doing for time? Actually, I think I'm, am I still within time? Let's get a time check. You're good. Okay, perfect, right. So yeah, just to finish, um, I'd like to just highlight that we have some really nice training resources and education resources available. And I'm part of the education team, so I'm involved in um, designing some of our online courses and, and rolling them out. Um, and currently we have a couple of, uh, of five-week asynchronous online courses where if you join the course, you have access to the full software suite in order to run all the course um, material. We have an introduction to molecular modeling drug discovery course and also uh, a molecular modeling concepts for polymers course. So with more of a material science um, focus. So I'd really uh, encourage you to check out those courses if you're interested in medicinal chemistry or molecular modeling um, in this sort of 3D space. Um, we also have lots of really useful knowledge base articles, which are kind of like handy FAQs um, in our Schrodinger knowledge base. There's a seminar series as well. We've got current seminars and previous seminars uh, and webinars and a script center as well. So for anyone that's, that's used Schrodinger software and is used to running things on the command line, we also have a number of scripts that you can be, can be used um, for that kind of, that kind of workflow. 
so yeah I'm gonna leave it there and just say thank you for again for the opportunity to be part of this webinar um, if you have any specific queries about online courses please reach out to the online learning team um, online learning at schrodinger.com and for any Columbia specific uh, faculty or students if you're having any uh, if you have any questions about Schrodinger software licenses access, then please reach out to the Columbia account manager, um, Heidi Klein, who uh, has, again, happily said she's available to be contacted via the email address here. So, again, thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to the other talks. Thank you, Abby. That was wonderful. Uh, very well enjoyed. <clears throat> All right. Up next, we have Art and Science of the Cellular Mesoscale with David Goodsell. Uh, David is the Professor of Computational Biology at the Scripps Research Institute and Research Professor at Rutgers State University. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome David to this panel. Hi, David. Well, thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Robert, for inviting me to, uh, to join in. I'm very much looking forward to the other talks and Abigail, I really enjoyed your uh, whirlwind uh, preview of, of Maestro. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, and I will do this. Okay, we're looking good. Good. Uh, so today, you know, I'll just take a little opportunity here to walk you through some work that I've been doing over oh, the past 30 years of trying to depict this level of scale between molecules and living cells. So the goal of these pictures is to create a cross section through a living system and uh, show all of the macromolecules at the right size, the right scale, the right abundance and all of that. So for instance, here is a, an illustration that I did for a journal cover uh, showing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 down here at lower right cross-section through the virion with the spike proteins in magenta and all of the um, RNA and proteins inside in blue and antibodies in bright yellow around on the outside. And so I'll just walk, th walk you through a little bit of the process that I do to put these together and then a few of the applications. Um, so these, these type of pictures are a lot of fun to do and uh, for, for two two reasons in particular. First of all, uh, the scale level is largely still invisible to experiment. So cryo-EM is getting to the stage where it can almost get down to this level. So cryo-EM these days can see where these ribosomes are, where these larger protein complexes are, but all the smaller stuff and the, the details of the DNA and everything inside cells is still a little fuzzy in cryo-EM. Who knows, maybe in 10 years, uh, they'll be able to, to see everything, but at least for now, we really need to synthesize these types of, of these types of visualizations from a bunch of disparate types of data to try to imagine what we could see if we could actually see it. <clears throat> the second fun thing about this is that it's a really nice opportunity to integrate the current state of knowledge about a particular system. And so here's an example. Uh, over here on the left is a picture I did of an E. coli cell back in 1999, when there was almost enough information to support uh, this, this kind of integrative approach. And then over here on the right is one that I just completed a couple of weeks ago, uh, updating everything, uh, on as much information as I could find about it. So you can see there are lots and lots and lots of differences. The, uh, there's a lot more information on this wonderful uh, flagellar motor, uh, a lot of details about that. Um, lots of uh, proteins that are intrinsically disordered, um, like the little arms on the pyruvate dehydrogenase complexes, uh, these little arms coming off of the ribosomes, I think it's L12. Um, I'm no longer drawing this HU protein like a nucleosome <laughs> because there are structures for that. The, the whole uh, uh, replosome is uh, with the replication fork is much more complicated now. It's not a, a tight little complex. It's all connected together with floppy chains and stuff. So just tons and tons of information kind of underscoring the growth in knowledge 
over these past 20 years, 20, 30 years uh, in, uh, the, in every aspect of this, all of the individual molecules, how they're arranged and how they interact. Uh, so I'll walk you through the process here uh, for a picture I did back uh, in uh, the earlier part of last year, right when the, um, the COVID scare was starting. Uh, and we didn't really know a whole lot about the virus at the time. So I thought, you know, I needed to start creating some pictures uh, to, to start having people think about the structural biology of this and have um, some images as a touch, touchstone for thinking about it. And so I did this, this picture back in February last year, uh, showing a coronavirus surrounded by respiratory mucosa. So all these green strands are mucins uh, and the yellow guys are, are antibodies. Uh, at the time, almost nothing was known about the new, at the time, novel coronavirus. Uh, so I based this on the previous uh, SARS virus uh, back from, uh, what was that, uh, 2019, or uh, 2015, because there was a lot more information on that. Um, and so the first thing to do at half the time for putting one, one of these pictures together is trying to dig up enough information to support it. And so the kind of information that goes into this, first of all, I go to the protein data bank and look for as many structures as I can find uh, and use um, whatever your favorite uh, viewer is, like Maestro. Um, uh, and here I'm using one of the, the viewers at the RCSB uh, protein data bank site. And so I use this to get the shapes of molecules and measure off distances to get the size right, stuff like that. Unfortunately, there are also uh, molecules that aren't structurally characterized as well as that. And so I have to use other uh, resources for that. In, in the middle here is a model that I was doing in my lab of what the um, RNA and uh, nuclear protein looked like, a uh, coarse grain model of that. And so I used that, that research uh, result uh, when drawing the picture. I also dug up a bunch of cryo EM pictures of the whole virion to make sure that the, the virus was the right size and the spikes were, uh, that there were enough spikes. And uh, unfortunately, there are some proteins that there just isn't any structural information. So down at the bottom here is uh, the best I could do for the membrane protein, uh, which was going to uniprot and just uh, figuring out what the, the length of it is, the number of amino acids, and predictions on which parts interact with the membrane, and then kind of faking up a, a picture of the molecule that's consistent with that information. Some process pictures of putting the painting together. I do all this uh, with uh, traditional media. Uh, start with a pencil sketch up here, uh, bringing together uh, all of the information that, that I've dug up. Uh, transfer that to watercolor paper uh, and paint, just start dropping in colors one at a time. It's kind of like paint by number at this point. So here are the spikes are in, here all of the um, mucins are in and the uh, interior of the virion. And then after all these little white spaces are filled in with some background molecules, here's what the final one looks like. The whole process start to finish uh, generally takes um, 15 to 20 hours for a, a picture like this. Uh, so I do a lot of this work uh, in association with the RCSP Protein Data Bank. Uh, so we decided at the time to, to do some other types of activities to take advantage of, of um, these type of pictures. And so we did a coloring book uh, a version of the, uh, of the painting and sent that out uh, to the, um, the universe out there. And you know, at the time we were all uh, glued to our screens, right? Because it was really our only way to interact with people <laughs> was through the computers. Uh, so, I, I, we got a really nice uh, response back from social media of people uh, just doing all kinds of fun stuff with this, uh, uh, this coloring activity, all the way from uh, young kids doing things that uh, a lot of adults uh, spent some time playing with it, uh, some fluorescent paint here in the middle, just all kinds of stuff. These came just uh, for free on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, it was really quite an enjoyable time. And uh, for the first time, actually, I, I had a really close contact uh, with a lot of people that were using these, uh, these illustrations. And so uh, for the painting, almost all of the responses were this kind of a thing, uh, which 
was saying that the painting was kind of defusing the virus for people, it was making it a way to, to get a handle on it, to think of it as an object uh, that you can understand and fight. Uh, and since the colors were nice, that kind of helped defuse it as well. And, and so that, that was really nice to see. And also got a whole bunch of comments from people talking about how they were using the exercise with their kids uh, as a way to talk about the virus and the scary things that were happening in our lives at the time. And, and again, just trying to, to take the edge off it all, to, um, uh, to just make people understand that it's a thing that they could understand and fight. It wasn't an invisible enemy. So that was really nice. Uh, so in the months since then, uh, more and more and more and more information, of course, has come out uh, about the virus. And so I've been doing paintings every couple of months, uh, trying to keep up with the, the, the immense amount of knowledge that is, uh, is being gathered about the virus. And so here are two recent ones I've done in the, the, the past couple of months. Uh, over here on the left is um, a picture of the virus fusing with um, uh, the endosomal membrane inside a cell. Uh, incorporating a bunch of new information from uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So uh, this, the, the SARS-CoV-2 actually has much uh, far fewer spike proteins than the, the previous one. Uh, and people are finding that they're also really floppy, that they bend a lot. Uh, and then uh, there's th this uh, the RNA and the nuclear protein in the, in the inside. It's still really fuzzy what's going on with that. It appears to be these little uh, clumps, punctate uh, complexes, as opposed to a long rope-like strand. Um, so, uh, but uh, when I was doing this painting, the, the details of what these proteins look like was completely done by intuition, not based on, on real solid structural biology. Over here on the right is a very idealized conception of the uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, like the Pfizer Moderna uh, vaccine showing the, the RNA on the inside and these pegylated uh, lipids decorating the outside, all surrounded by blood, blood plasma. And so uh, all of these paintings that I do, I, I'm very lucky uh, working with the RCSB Protein Data Bank that, um, that they're making them available uh, on the site for use for education or whatever people want to use them for. So that is always fun to get this work out into people's hands. We're also trying to move from uh, this kind of artistic semi-quantitative approach to a more quantitative approach, going from art, uh, more into from sci art, more into to, uh, science. Uh, and this poses a lot of big, big challenges, as you can imagine. Um, so over here is a picture uh, just recently completed in the lab of a mycoplasma cell, a whole mycoplasma cell, uh, including the DNA, the RNA, the proteins, the membrane, everything. Uh, this was done by a postdoc, Martina Martin, and a really talented program in our, in our lab, uh, Ludovic Auden, uh, with our cell pack suite of protein or programs. And so this, there, there are lots of huge challenges with this process. One is that the biological complexity itself poses big challenges. So everything is super crowded. The shapes are really wacky that you have to fit together, and everything has specific interactions with everything else. So you have to account for all of that in the modeling process. There's also a big um, integration and curation challenge of finding this information and curating it and putting it in a form that you can use. So I, we're pulling from multiple databases and trying to uh, come up with a common way to integrate all of those diverse pieces of data. And then there are also the big comp uh, computational infrastructure, big data problems that these kind of huge um, models pose, um, we tend, whoops, we tend to break <laughs> all of the common viewers, right? Because the, the things just get uh, so complicated, things get so slow. Um, so hopefully uh, if computers are, are constantly improving. So uh, probably tomorrow it'll be fine, but today it's still a challenge. Uh, so now I'll move and just show that uh, we're, we're also trying to develop some tools to make uh, these type of models more accessible to a wider 
uh, group of people. The CELPAC suite that I showed in the previous slide is really the domain of experts right now. It's a, it's a really tricky, tricky package to use. But this tool, Cell Paint, is designed to be useful uh, to, to high school students and undergrads and um, whoever wants to use it. So it's modeled after a typical digital painting program where you pick brushes and you draw stuff into a palette or into a, um, uh, a screen space. Um, and so over here is a picture of, uh, again, SARS-CoV-2 surrounded by blood plasma on a cell down here at the, at the bottom. Uh, all the molecules are over here in a, in a palette. You pick them and draw them in. Uh, in the recent version, we've also, uh, based on a lot of user response, uh, included a panel that allows you to pull uh, whatever molecule you want from the protein data bank and create uh, custom brushes for that. So if you want to do your own your own system, that's now possible. Show you a quick little movie here it's in action, what it looks like. Uh, this is sped up by five times, so I don't actually draw this quickly. Um, and so here we are dropping in uh, the membrane and the spikes and moving them around in places that we want, adding membrane protein here, um, picking a bunch of uh, soluble uh, molecules, drop in a few antibodies, and then raising the temperature at the end to kind of mix everything up. So the goal is just to make it really easy for, for people to create these kind of illustrations so they don't have to spend the 20 hours it takes to, to research and, um, uh, and paint these things. And a lot of the uh, scientific uh, details are taking care of you. So membrane proteins stay in membranes and they come in at the right size. Uh, so all you need to do is place them and make sure you have the right number of them. Uh, that's not right. Uh, and so if you're interested in playing with this, it's uh, freely available on our site up here. The URL is up at the top. Uh, and we're also right in the middle of doing a contest at the Protein Data Bank. Um, and so we have two uh, topics that we're asking people to, to create pictures. Uh, one is anything related to vaccines. And so we've dropped in a few new brushes to, to create uh, pictures of this mRNA vaccine and uh, endoplasmic reticulum and all kinds of stuff. And we also want people just to be as creative as they can be to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the, the protein data bank. So if you're interested, send us some pictures by the end of, of the month and we'll, we'll put them in the contest for you. And then here's just a little preview of the kind of stuff people have been doing with it in a contest that we did last year with an earlier version. And boy, it's just amazing. People just come up with the most fun ideas. Uh, so they, uh, they did some really, a few people did some really nice uh, infographic kind of things with it, um, all the way down to people doing portraits of Rosalind Franklin and down here's this wonderful Pac-Man made out of antibodies jumping out on the virus and just all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, so, I mean, this is just exactly what we want, what we want to do is give people the freedom to play uh, in this molecular cellular space. And then I'll just finish up with this picture. Uh, th this is what a thing I've been doing, just visualization for the sake of visualization, just to be fun. And getting back to my roots is, being trained as a crystallographer. So this is a crystal lattice uh, of the major protease from uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is the, the, a picture of the actual lattice uh, in the, the crystal structure determination. And it's also like one of those magic eye pictures. So if you stick your nose right on it and kind of let your eyes diverge, <clears throat> it'll turn into a, a 3D picture if you can get it to work. Some, some days I can get it to work, some days it doesn't work so well. Anyways, a bunch of these are on the, the RCSP PDB site as well. But sometimes you just have to play games just for fun, you know? And I guess that's what I have for you today, just uh, to thank everyone, uh, both at the RCSP PDB and at Scripps um, uh, for the type of work we do. Many thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Um, uh, we're going to take a uh, five minute break now uh, and uh, then we will be back with uh, Tal Danino and Gail McGill. So now's your chance to do whatever you need to do during your break. 
Um, okay. Hey, Robert, I just want to check if my sound works. All good. We're ready to start when you are. All right, thanks. So give it one more minute and start at 153. OK. Okay, welcome back. Uh, next person up uh, will be Tal Danino uh, with his presentation on bacteria as a new medium for art and science. Tal Danino is uh, the professor of uh, biomedical engineering at Columbia University. Welcome, Tal. All right, thanks, Nikki, uh, for that introduction. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, talk about a uh, slightly larger scale of uh, thinking about bacteria 
And uh, it's really something that's been on our group and many other groups mind and, and especially in popular culture with uh, this concept of the microbiome uh, and all the bacteria that are in and on your body and have a vital and important impact on our health. They do things like produce vitamins and ward off pathogens and stimulate and regulate immunity within our bodies. And so the idea is that we could manipulate these niches of bacteria um, for instance, by taking probiotics or fermented foods, and uh, that this could improve our health in, in some ways. So this has been really an exciting concept in the last decade or so. And, and sorry, I just realized that I'm not on video. Okay, sorry about that. And uh, so, so our group, uh, you know, is really interested in this concept of using bacteria and probiotics as a therapy. Um, but more so in, in trying to really tweak and genetically engineer a single probiotic or community of probiotics um, to, uh, to have an impact on, on health uh, and disease. So that's where synthetic biology comes in. It's really an engineering discipline that tries to design, build, and test in an iterative fashion uh, new functions in, in living organisms. And the goal is really to try to create what we think of as living medicines, it's an entirely new class of medicines to be inside your body and surveil for healthy and disease states and then uh, respond in, in a particular fashion. Maybe that's making a drug or producing a diagnostic of, of some sort. And many groups are working on different, different organisms. We, we have primarily focused on bacteria uh, and we engineer them by building what we call uh, genetic circuits. Uh, these are kind of like electrical circuits, or you can think about them as a computer program embedded in the bacteria uh, that allows uh, or engineers bacteria to really uh, have them sense a particular signal or signals and then respond accordingly. And we do that by programming the DNA of uh, bacteria like E. coli. So I'm not going to get too much into the detail of that, but uh, you can feel free to ask if you want to uh, know more about how we engineer bacteria. So this concept has, has really been around for the last um, 10, 20 years ago. And even when I was a student, I built um, this circuit that you see here inside of a bacteria. Um, and, 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 and like we talked about, it's an abstract piece of DNA here that programs the bacteria. It has a couple of genes with these boxes. And what the sequence does is essentially has the bacteria produce fluorescent GFE molecules in an on and off rhythmic fashion. And uh, in addition to that, also allows bacteria to communicate by making some of these small molecules. So it's not just a single bacteria that we're programming, but a community. And so uh, when you look at bacteria under the microscope um, and specifically into their fluorescence channel, you see that they can actually perform this interesting behavior. So this is a colony of bacteria. It's about the width of a human hair for, for sort of sense of scale. And every bacteria has that genetic program and they make this molecule that travels between them and allows them to turn on and off in synchrony. Uh, and it's quite effective at this scale, but because that molecule can only travel so fast, uh, it, it really in larger colonies of bacteria turns into these traveling waves, almost like the waves in, 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 a, in a crowd in a stadium. Um, and this is an interesting, uh, type of bacterial behavior called quorum sensing. It exists naturally uh, in communities of bacteria. And it's how they communicate and tell each other when to trigger coordinated and virulent behaviors. But we've reprogrammed it here in, in sort of a different fashion. And one of my favorite movies is actually here where this colony of bacteria begins to grow and it only starts to fluoresce when it hits this critical density. So it's quite clear in this movie when they hit a critical density to fluoresce and there's not a critical density on the border and they repeatedly fluoresce on, on sort of the interior and the intermediate areas. So this you know, is uh, one of my favorite uh, microscopic videos that I took as a student and we called it the supernova. So it looks like something you would see in, in outer space even though it's something on, on very much the micro scale. Um, in fact, I, I found this picture of a cake that my friend made me an image of the supernova. Um, and, and I remember at that time, uh, nobody really wanted to eat it because it, you know, it looked like it was made of bacteria. Um, so it was just sort of left intact there. And uh, so, so probably, you know, you can, you can appreciate, I was seeing all these things as a student and um, 
you know, they, they really look like works of art in and of themselves. And um, as other students do, this for me was the, the sort of the first time I started thinking deeply about how to use the visual arts to communicate science, communicate our own research. And that, that started with uh, outreach activities and presentations and things like that, just communicating with these very visual and, and even hypnotic movies that uh, allow viewers to really uh, see, what, see what we were seeing and, and really be involved in the research. So um, as, as our lab developed, you know, we, we do think really uh, probably more, more often on the applications. And um, for us, cancer therapy is, is really a big one. Um, and we published a couple of papers in the last few years on thinking about bacteria that surveil the body and could find and home in on tumors and then produce drugs that could treat these tumors. You can think of them as like microbial tri Trojan horses that get into a tumor and then are programmed to sense and respond to that environment. Um, so uh, that, that's really what my lab works on. And a, a lot of this really started in, in sharing the vision of our own research in cancer. Uh, which is oftentimes very impactful, um, but you know, it doesn't always connect with the human experience per se. And so what was born out of that was really this new direction um, to engage with people on a fundamentally deeper level by purposefully creating artworks with materials from the lab. And a lot of the themes that we work on are, are really how the hidden um, microscopic universe uh, connects with Macroscopic society and in our increasingly biotechnological world, um, and then that that could actually in turn lead to creative innovations in in cancer research. And we'll, we'll share a couple of examples of that. We have some concrete ways that which that has happened. Okay, so the kind of artworks that we make with bacteria and materials in the lab, um, as you can imagine, really showcase these fascinating worlds of bacteria and how they live in and on our bodies, but also in almost every eco ecosystem you can imagine, uh, in soil and sand and water and even in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, here is an example of, of many different species and, and types of bacteria and types of conditions that we can grow bacteria in. And our process typically starts with thinking about how bacteria are connected to a particular theme. And there's, you know, there's almost always a connection. Uh, and then we sample these bacteria, grow them in these special conditions that make them form these fractal-like patterns. And so what you're looking at here is if you look at a particular dish, we usually put a drop of bacteria here and then they grow outwards in these fractal or snowflake-like patterns. Um, it's a really interesting process that not all bacteria do, but um, we can sort of coax and, and uh, change these conditions by, by varying different types of inputs. Um, now each Petri dish, you know, to us looks like its own little universe. You can't tell if it's something at the bottom of the ocean or in a faraway galaxy, similar to that supernova image that I shared. And um, this, that's why we, we call this series the micro universe. And if you think about the color, these aren't false colored, but they're actually physically colored with scientific and artistic dyes that um, are oftentimes used to classify bacteria and differentially uh, take up these dyes to allow us to create um, levels of contrast. And we oftentimes play with this notion, I think if you if you didn't know any better, that it seems like we perfectly calculated and arranged these bacteria in exactly this way within a dish. Um, but it turns out it's 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 very unpredictable and every every dish that we make is in, is extremely unique. We can never reproduce any one of these images. Um, and so that's where this balance of the, the chaos and the control comes in. Um, one of the themes that we touch upon, how do we control nature um, or, our, or our probiotics and our research, for instance, and, and how, how bacteria sometimes don't care about those plans and evolve and uh, be care, become essentially collaborators in the artworks in uh, themselves. So uh, I'm gonna share a couple of the, the different images and, and versions of this. This is a science communication effort at the Liberty Science Center. We think a lot about the, uh, the different ways we can show bacteria. Sometimes it's an image or a, or a light box behind the image or a print. And sometimes it's the physical material itself. So actually in these slide bounds here that you see on the right, we, um, we actually cut out the physical pieces of bacteria and we can project through them on a carousel projector. We've done that a few times in some venues. 
Um, and then we've created uh, more interactive like exhibits uh, by using uh, augmented reality on a smartphone. Um, that's one of the ways that I think we try to highlight the, the really dynamic presence of bacteria, even though they're, they're so small, they're incredibly um, active. And so we try to highlight this in, in, in different ways with, with um, different kinds of technologies. It's an example actually of a time-lapse video of a bacteria. It's one of my favorite ones uh, that is called uh, Proteus mirabilis. So, uh, you know, for, for us uh, as a science lab, we think about, you know, how, how does this happen? That's one of the interesting questions to us. And two, from a bioengineering perspective, can we engineer behaviors like this? And, and actually in synthetic biology, our, our technical abilities to do that are, are actually not quite there yet. Um, but nature has been able to make these patterns. And so we're starting to mix our abilities to engineer, try to engineer these patterns and nature's a ability to make these patterns in, in some of our new artworks. And, and then also think about what they can be used for um, in controlling their spatial and temporal behaviors. Uh, so this is an interesting bacteria that we sampled in the sand from California. Um, you can zoom in and see uh, these, these bacteria. Again, the bacteria are too small to see, but every dot is probably you know, maybe a million bacteria or so. So we're not quite at the microscopic level here, but there's still a lot of intricate detail. Um, we play a lot with the preservation of bacteria in um, different, different kinds of glass dishes with epoxies and preservatives and um, try to think about really documenting the ephemeral nature of bacteria, especially when we recontextualize the work in the art context, we uh, really are looking for something that's long lasting and, and could be preserved and, and, and not necessarily degrade, although we're interested in the degradation process as well. Um, so I, I would say that uh, we've done this in, in, in many different ways and we started out really quite broad in the visualization and uh, working on the aesthetics of bacteria. And, and then I, I think especially thinking about the themes of the microscopic universe and the impact on society. Um, and then over time, we really started to develop more distinct projects that um, allowed us to cover like, topics that were, that were interesting um, to us. So uh, this next one I'm gonna talk about is a project called Consensus. And this is a Petri dish you see here. Um, with a sampling of uh, over 400 people's bacteria that we got um, from a company that's called Consensus. And they're, they're known for um, creating the Ethereum cryptocurrency, it's kind of like Bitcoin. Um, and they essentially, 400 people touched this communal punch bowl and grew different, grew different species of bacteria from that. And so this uh, concept sort of uh, lends to the idea of um, community identity and interactions and, and how elements interact with one another, for example, in human organizations um, or in this company that is actually similar to their blockchain technology, very decentralized and flat. And, and so we drew a lot of similarities between those um, sort of systems level interactions with what happens at the microscopic level, which um, bacteria in, in these cases really just communicate with one another in a pretty uh, democratic way, um, so to speak. And there's not like a leader in the flock of animals or something. It's really a more decentralized and emergent type of system. Um, so transcrobial, this is another one where we started thinking about um, artificial intelligence and how bacteria not just interact with humans, but in the future will interact with machines and algorithms as well. And so here sprinkled out through this collage are actually um, uh, AI generated images that you can see, uh, which we actually had the algorithm learn from the real images and now started to create new patterns. Um, so essentially creating new examples of digital lives of bacteria that, um, that had never really been created before. And so uh, I think we got excited starting to think about how to create life beyond the biological realm and how in the future, uh, there'll be this interaction between um, humans, bacteria, and, and, uh, and AI. So uh, part of this exhibition uh, that we showed was um, bringing this to a, a physical reality, the, the digital specimens, um, as well as the, the, the biological specimen, specimens um, and, and figuring out different ways to 
display this and, and think about uh, the, the, um, the algorithmic properties and, and how, how these systems develop. This was at uh, Ars Electronica two years ago. Um, I'm gonna briefly go, I'm not sure how much time there is left, but uh, just really briefly talk about uh, another two projects. This one's called Fossils, just so you could see some images. Um, we thought about bacteria and the fossils they left behind. Um, Cause you see these, you know, very large pictures of uh, very large sculptures of dinosaurs and museums, but bacteria really didn't leave anything visible. Um, so we made these sort of projections of what, what it might look like and, and thought about the relationship between these early living organisms of bacteria and how they still coexist with us today. Okay, so um, we thought about how these bacteria coexist. And um, uh, lately we've been also thinking a lot about sustainability and uh, how we might be living in a post pandemic world. And we were inspired by images of aerial farms and thinking about how our systems, uh, agricultural processes and climate change and things like that are all impacted by soil that the bacteria live in. And, and there's a lot of really interesting connections um, there. Uh, and then lastly, we, we work on images and actually create some out of cancer cells, um, both digitally with um, histology or cancer cell images, or we actually print with um, cancer cells. We do screen printing. You can see them here on the glass and make some connections to uh, some of the sort of science and policy uh, events, especially in cancer research that have been happening over the last century. Um, and this is a, a print with over a billion cancer cells um, of this old uh, poster from the early 20th century that tried to raise awareness about cancer. Okay, so I'll, I just wanted to end on this image. And uh, this is one that was a collaboration with um, Vic Muniz. It's a mandala that was a symbol of life in the universe. And it's completely made out of um, cancer cells. And so uh, this was you know, a, a really uh, interesting collaboration for us. It, it, and this is where science and art really intersected in that to create this image, it's, it's only about a centimeter in size. Um, took some sophisticated technologies that uh, at that time, maybe 10 years ago were, uh, I, I don't think existed or were either really challenging to make so accurately. Um, and so we had to develop some of these technologies to make images um, actually for art. And that allowed us to think about the scale and how we can see both the image as a whole, as well as uh, the single cancer cells uh, as you zoom in on these images. So these are HeLa cells you know, that you may have heard of have this immortal long, uh, long lived and, and studied in the scientific community. And ultimately the idea is that these works would allow for inquiry and self-reflection and help shape, shape some of the dialogue and future policy for how um, science integrates with society. So with that, I just wanna thank everybody in our lab, uh, especially highlight Suni who has been working in the lab and actually has an art background, but learned how to do all of the, the science herself and has been creating um, a vast majority of these images and working a lot on these projects. Um, and then I just wanna thank Nikki and, and Robert and everybody for inviting me. Um, as well as our funding sources um, for our lab and, and, and our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. Thank you. That was that was really um, was actually quite moving somehow. <laughs> um, next up, we have Gail McGill with uh, capturing the SAR spike in motion, uh, visualizing a molecular contortionist. Uh, Gail, uh, welcome. Um, uh, it's I'm very happy to have you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll start sharing my slides and let me know if you can see them. Yes. Yes, we can. Great. Actually, you know what? I take it back. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to share the whole screen and then I'm going to go to presentation mode. Let me know if you can see this as well. Do you yes. see the, the first yes. slide? Great. Thank you. Yes. Great. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's uh, an honor to be part of this this great lineup. Um, the The main topic for today is, as the as the title reads, um, Nikki, you had asked me to spend just a few moments introducing my own background and, and kind of the genesis of Digizyme, my company as well. So I'll I'll jump in with that first, and then I'll I'll give a short talk on our work over the past about year and a half trying to understand the SARS-CoV-2 spike. 
So I split my life a little bit between kind of uh, as an academic and also uh, running Digizyme. And so on the academic side, I'm, I'm trained as a cell molecular biologist. Um, and, and I kind of transitioned all of my uh, bench work, I guess, um, maybe 15 years ago to visualization research. And so, you know, it used to look like the things on the left, and now it looks more like the things on the right in terms of at least my, my academic interests. Um, and I just wanted to mention one thing before I leave the, the realm of academia, and that's the kind of grant, for example, at the moment, uh, in collaboration with Jody Jenkinson and Susan Keene at UC Davis, uh, this network, visibly.org, where we're interested in the intersection of these otherwise siloed fields, educational research, science visualization, and, and biology instruction. And I just wanted to put it out there so that if people are interested in, in this topic, please check out our website and, and of course, contact me. Um, and then the other part of my life is through this, uh, this group that I started, this company called Digizyme. And the idea, and so I started this as a, as a second year graduate student uh, while, while doing my PhD at, at Harvard Medical School. And the idea was to, to try and open up the scope of different types of projects and clients and communities that we could serve um, while, while leveraging and, and uh, you know, building on our interest for science visualization. So the company is now over 20 years old. It's still a small team, but I think it's a, I like to think it's a rather unique team because everyone is dually trained in both art and science at, at different levels. And I think that that makes a difference in the way that we approach our projects and, and the types of projects that we can engage with. And so to give you a quick uh, intro to Digizyme, we've done a, a number of different types of projects for different industries. Uh, I won't go through all of them now. I've just put together some really quick examples, everything from more, you know, kind of infographic type pathways. That's a, um, a you know, poster that went out in every issue of Nature now, I think about 15 years ago. That was kind of a summary at that time of pathways in human cancer, of an extremely simplified summary, all the way to images like the one on the right, which of course, it, as, as anyone can tell, is deeply inspired by the inspirational work of, uh, of David Goodsell. It's kind of our, our poor attempt at, at one of those. Um, but we've also done, you know, our, our projects take us everywhere from kind of the photoreal, whether it's insects or, or devices, or in this case, part of a, you know, a dust mite eating a skin flake off a scalp at the Boston Museum of Science to uh, a mosquito about to take its first uh, suck out of a, a juicy a juicy arm. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun because through the company, we've been able to really engage on a, a wide variety of topics. I realize today is about visualizing molecular biology, but I, I did want to give a, a sense of the, the sampling of things we've done. And I'll end just with the, this kind of larger project that we were very fortunate to do a few years back in collaboration with Apple and, and co-authored with you Wilson. And that was a, a free digital textbook for iPad that covered kind of the high school AP bio curriculum. So everything from molecules to ecosystems um, and it was just an, an incredible opportunity to, to devise this material, both as authors and also, of course, to do all of the visualization work to, to support its development. All right, so that was the quick intro. I, I want to switch gears and, and focus and share on really one of these internal projects we've had at Digizyme over the past year and, and to try to reflect and think on you know, what are the ways in which we can offer, uh, uh, contribute, I guess, to all of the incredible information that's been put out there. Um, and so what we decided to focus on is a process that we're very interested in, and that is the way in which the virus actually enters cells. So in order to enter cells, I'll come back to this in a minute, SARS-CoV-2, of course, needs to bind, and then it needs to induce membrane fusion. And that is really the purpose of the spike. It's the, it's the protein, it's, it's, a, it's an engine that drives these two membranes to come together, after which, of course, the viral genome spills into the host cell and game over. So that's what I'd like to share with you today. And um, before I jump into our work, I thought I'd give you a really quick overview of what we've seen over the past year or so, because um, it's been an incredible progression 
not only of, of new information, but to just see how the scientific community has, has rallied and accelerated its pace. So it started as early as March 2020 with uh, detailed structural studies, uh, X-ray, cryo-EM studies. And again, I'm going to go through these rather quickly, but we started to gain more information about the different states of what I'll refer to as the pre-fusion spike, in other words, the spike that we see on variants before they've attached to cells for the most part, and the notion that this RBD, this receptor binding domain, was basically uh, undergoing a conformational change, kind of an up-down hide-and-seek with the immune system in a sense. Um, we also learned more and structures came out on the interaction of the spike with the human receptor, the ACE2 uh, protein. Um, there were some incredible studies also done on this layer of, of glycans that, it, that covers the spike and that makes it that much harder uh, as other viruses do like HIV and others, uh, almost like a, a, a sugar-based cloak surrounding this protein that makes it harder for our immune system to, to detect it. And there were some interesting studies looking at that, not only look at the structure of the glycans, but their dynamics, as well as the dynamics of the entire spike. And again, I, I have to apologize to all those for whom the, the research is not presented here, but I've just picked a few uh, representative examples of, of some of the research. So in this case, uh, some studies looking at, through different methods, molecular dynamics and other methods, what is that spike, spike flexibility? What are some of the hinges um, and, and studies like this? And then finally, uh, and, and of course, a bit scary as well, has been the way in which the virus has evolved. Um, this now almost feels like an old slide, but um, you know, just to, to remember that the virus, even as early as, as March and April of last year, we were starting to see a different variant coming up, this D614G mutation, which became so prevalent. And now, of course, we're seeing that changing into new variants and, and trying to understand what those are. So that's a really quick overview just to kind of set the stage um, and, and to focus in on the, the contribution that we were trying to make. And that is to, to try and take all of this information, this rich structural dynamic information, but what we felt was still missing in a sense is kind of an end-to-end -end visualization, at least of just the membrane fusion process, not the whole life cycle, and, and people are addressing that as well. But we wanted to look at this complex process that drives initial attachment and then fusion of the two membranes. And so for those of you who are not familiar, it's, it's at its very basic, it's what's shown on screen. It's the process of taking two entities, both surrounded by, by membranes, and, and getting those membranes to fuse such that the contents of the virus become uh, get onto the inside of the cells. And if you look a little bit more, more uh, with more detail at the process, it's actually this incredibly complex puzzle in, in space and time. Um, and the rest of the talk is about that, so I won't describe this graphic in, in great detail, but the idea is that you know, on the left, you start with a protein, which is mostly the one that we see on all the journal covers and a lot of the, the figures, and that is the pre-fusion spike. In other words, the way that the virus presents the spike to the host cell even before binding it. And then there's an initial attachment period, which is followed then by a series of conformational changes, whereby the, a part of the spike brings together the membranes of the virus and the host and lead to fusion. And so the question is, what does that choreography look like? Um, and just there are a few, I think, words that are worth mentioning now because I'll, I'll keep using them through the presentation. So all the way on the left is this pre-fusion spike conformation. Then as I'll show you, there's a conformational changes whereby the, the cap of the spike is lost. and the, the underlying piece of the spike essentially latches out and, and stabs the host cell and, and latches onto it. And that's what's called the pre-hairpin intermediate, in, in, kind of in the middle on the left here. And then if you look all the way on the right, once this membrane fusion has, has happened, then you have what's called a post-fusion intermediate, where the spike has yet again undergone a, a, undergone a, a conformational change that has brought the two membranes together. 
And I think it's worth mentioning also that in order to create the kinds of visualizations that I'm about to show you, we, we don't just look at SARS or COVID-2, we look at other proteins that are part of a, a much larger family of what are called class one viral proteins. So for example, other viruses like HIV or flu or even Ebola and, and others have proteins on their surface that even though they may look rather different upon first inspection, the underlying mechanism by which they drive membrane fusion is essentially the same. It's the same, it's a, it's a you know, variations on a theme. Um, and so I'm, what I'm showing on the left is the SARS-CoV-2 influenza in the middle, HIV on the right. I'll, I'm going to remove these uh, cap proteins, which are usually the parts of the proteins that um, mediate initial attachment to a cellular receptor. But that cap is then lost only to uncover this other portion, which in the spike on the left is called the S2. And so that is the actual fusion machine. And I'm highlighting some of the helices in different colors. Notice that they all share kind of a central set of orange helices called the central helix. And on the outside of those are folded these other alpha helices in, in yellow. And what we're going to be showing is that during the conformational change, during the, the way in the spike reaches out and stabs the host protein, those alpha helices refold and extend that central helix. And I'll, I'll show all of this, of course, in a minute. But before moving on, I just wanted to say that, you know, we're, we're not completely shooting in the dark in the sense that we have other viruses and their proteins where we know the mechanism is shared so that the, the underlying principles are the same. And, and this has been very useful in guiding our visualizations. So the, the basic process that we went through to, to kind of solve this puzzle, first you need to start with you know, the right molecular actors. And uh, despite, of course, the protein data bank being this unbelievable resource, more often than not, the proteins that are there because of the, the ways in which they were solved or the methodologies are either truncations or have gaps in them um, or, or just some domains. And so the first thing you need to do is to really assemble a full length model of, of the protein that you're going to be working with. And to do this, and you know, actually, even before I jump into that, I want to make absolutely sure everyone's kind of on the on the same page in terms of the the structural biology of the spike. So I've just included a few uh, slides to to remind people about the structure of the spike. So the spike protein is made up of two proteins, S1 and S2. And I won't go into the fact that it 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 actually needs to be cleaved a couple of times by different proteases to be active, but the result is is this um, this S1 and S2 portion, there is, as I mentioned earlier, as part of S1, this RBD, this receptor binding domain, which will actually contact the ACE2 receptor on the host cell. And I mentioned the glycans already as well. Now, S2 in yellow here is the actual membrane fusion machine. It is anchored in the viral membrane, which you don't see, but is on the, on the bottom of the screen. And that's the thing that undergoes massive conformational changes. Okay, so that's just for context. So in terms of modeling the spike, basically I, I wanted to give you an idea. We don't need to go through all the different domains, but S1 and S2 are kind of the two big proteins. Each are made up of these uh, numerous subdomains. And in thinking about the modeling work that we had to do to, to produce a full length spike, I just thought I would show you a picture of some of the the, the starting structural information, I included PDB information, but also all in all of the red um, structure gaps that we had to, to model in. And to do that modeling, we actually use our own software that we've been developing for over a decade now called Molecular Maya that leverages all of the all of the great tools that come out of the kind of Hollywood entertainment industry. So Maya is what's used for a lot of the, the Pixar movies, the Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, those types of, of special effects laden movies. But what we're able to do with, with some additional software programming is to create our own layer of, of code on top of Maya so that it can receive and, and work with molecular and other types of data. So in this case, we used our, our molecular modeling kit to 
facilitate the, the filling of these gaps. So what we do is we know the primary structure. So we're able to basically pose um, these intervening peptides and interactively create these structures in, in a very rapid way. And I'll, I'll have a few more slides in a minute about exactly what is happening when we're doing, posing these and synthesizing these peptides. Um, but I just wanted to show you an example of that. And so once you have the starting molecular actors to work with, then comes the job of actually putting them into motion. And for this, I wanted to, so for this, we used a, a different kit that we've developed called the, the Molecular Rigging and Animation Kit. And what this kit allows you to do is you can bring in molecular data, but, and then you can then, by, by literally the click of a button, you can create a molecular rig that facilitates the, the dynamic simulation and animation of that molecular structure. And so I want to be very clear about what these rigs allow you to do and what they don't claim to do, because I think it's important for what I'll show next. So many of you may be familiar with kind of the, the more hardcore uh, molecular simulation techniques like molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics is this incredible simulation technique. It's, it's very intensive in terms of computation, but it provides not only a way to, it, it, it essentially creates an environment of, um, of, of what your, your uh, molecular entity of interest is, in this case a protein, what that environment is with all of the different parameters like temperature, pressure, and then it allows you to create a, a predictive simulation of how that structure will change over time. And in a sense, nothing, nothing beats that, right? So that's for, for predictive simulations, molecular dynamics is still kind of where it's at. Our rigging and animation kit leverages parts of molecular dynamics, but it is not, it's not a predictive simulation method. Instead, what it allows us to do in a, in a coarse grained way is to steer structures to undergo conformational changes where we're still respecting all of the bond distances and angles that we know should be maintained. So we can't stretch things out in ways that are unnatural. But what we save is all of the forces that are incredibly uh, computationally intense to calculate. So we don't have solvent, we don't have hydrophobic forces, we don't have electrostatic forces. And I just wanted to make that very clear. So what I've just shown here in this little movie, for example, is how we can goal a particular peptide chain to undergo conformations between different secondary structures, right? So from a, a flexible loop to an alpha helix or to a beta strand. And the, and the part of the way we do that is by using other tools in the field, like in this case, uh, things called elastic networks, where we can maintain the shapes of certain domains while steering these dynamic simulations. So all of this background is, is again, to, to set better context for what we did with the spike. So back to the choreography of how you go from the pre-fusion spike all the way to fused membranes. The first intermediate to try to understand is the process right after the virus has bound to the cell and the S1 cap on the spike protein falls off. And now this S2 fusion machine is ready to do its work. And the first thing it does is we know that it somehow unfolds, reaches out and, and essentially stabs, embeds itself into the cellular membrane at the bottom. And so what we know is that that central helix is basically serving as a core that elongates. If you remember in the image I was showing you earlier that showed HIV and flu and SARS, I was showing you the, both the yellow and the orange helices. I'll go back one step just to show this one more time. Notice that the yellow pieces are refolding into alpha helices that are projecting these kind of teal regions into the membrane. Those are what are called the fusion peptides or fusion platforms. So what you see in front of you now is what's called the pre-hairpin intermediate. Membrane fusion hasn't happened yet. The only thing that's happened is that the virus has now tethered itself to the host membrane. Now, from an energetic 
point of view, the, the tough job still remains because membranes don't typically like to fuse with each other, right? So what the protein is going to do is refold on itself yet again. And in refolding, it will pull these membranes together and force them to interact and fuse. So and essentially, it's, it's this transition that we're trying to simulate. So how do we know what happens? How do we know what this transition looks like? Well, one of the methods that we have that is not a really kind of a, a structural method in the same sense as X-ray or NMR or cryo-EM, but more of a spectroscopy method is this thing called circular dichroism. And what that essentially does without going into the details, it, it allows you to assess the state of a, of a fold of a protein. So for example, it lets you know the amount of alpha helical content in a solution of, of your particular protein. So if a protein is refolding, and if the alpha helical content of that protein is increasing, this spectroscopy method will tell you that. And I bring it up because that's exactly what the spike is doing, right? And this is actually now over 10 years old. I had tried to, to visualize a very similar process that is happening in HIV. Uh, I won't go through the methods at the time that I used to create this animation, but they were not at all what we're using now. This, this was actually much more time consuming and a lot, a lot slower and not as accurate because I had to model all of these intermediates by hand. What I'll show you next though, is what our new software allows us to do. And that is to actually show what the alpha helical transition is as the spike is refolding on itself, undergoing this alpha helical transition and driving the two membranes together. Again, let me, let me bring it back. So if you look at the domains, kind of purplish domains at the top, Notice that these domains are going to refold themselves along the grooves of this coiled, yellow coiled, coiled region below. And it's this refolding, this alpha helical transition, which provides the motor force by which the two membranes are brought together. And it's thought, although uh, without going into too much detail today, it's thought that you need a minimum of two spikes to drive this membrane fusion, possibly three. I'm not sure that that's entirely clear for SARS-CoV-2 yet, although these types of studies have been really ongoing for things like influenza and HIV, where again, we can, we can look to those systems to, to try and better understand this one. So I'll spend maybe just a minute to show a version of this movie that we created that's, you know, it's got a voiceover, it's a little bit more, uh, you know, stylistically dressed up, let's say, and I'll, I'll play that for just a minute. Upon ACE2 binding, the cap portion of the spike protein falls off, exposing the fusion machinery below. Unstable, like a spring-loaded jackknife, the spike is rigged for action. With a protective cap removed, it unfolds, extends towards the host cell membrane, and latches on. Now that the fusion machine bridges the two membranes, one end embedded in the virus and the other end bound to the cell, it refolds on itself, bringing the membranes so close together that they fuse. Once merged, the genome of the virus spills out into the cell, hijacks its protein factories, and produces many more viruses. So this is obviously work in progress because as I, I, I kind of cringe as I watch these movies again, because there, there are still things we need to add, right? So a lot of these surfaces are, are incredibly simplified to clarify the mechanism, but also an obvious addition that we have yet to work on is to add the viral genome so that we can actually show how the viral, uh, how the membrane fusion process leads to um, delivery of the genome. So, I'm going to end the talk with uh, a, a collaboration that we had actually with two labs at Columbia that we were really excited to, to um, lend our, our visualization expertise to the study. And this is a study that came out in science now just a, a few weeks ago, I believe, um, looking at you know, a type of inhibitor that can block this process 
So as, as many of you are probably aware, there have been a lot of different approaches to trying to block this virus, all the way from vaccines, antivirals, things that look at more downstream steps in the viral life cycle. But I think a very interesting step is, and of course I'm biased because we look at membrane fusion, an interesting step is to see, can we block the process of, of that refolding that I showed you? And so in, in the labs of, um, of Porota and Moscona and, and others, essentially what they've created is they've used parts of the sequence of the spike of the S2 region to create really a kind of a, an inhibitor that will bind to the spike in its pre hairpin conformation and block its refolding. And so just to quickly summarize more in static form, this is what I just showed you in terms of the evolution of the membrane process, membrane fusion process under normal circumstances. And in the presence of this inhibitor, which in this case is, is shown kind of on the bottom in these red peptides, they're tethered to the membrane through um, uh, an addition of cholesterol and another linker. What happens is that linker will now sit in those grooves that otherwise are occupied by the green segment. And by sitting there and having bound that region, the spike is blocked in terms of the refolding. And I can show you this process in motion. Um, so again, just to, to summarize what we're seeing, this is the S2 portion. The normal situation on the left, the inhibitor containing situation on the right. So here we're seeing the transition from the pre-fusion spike to the pre-hairpin spike, where it's embedding the fusion peptides into the host cell. And it's at this stage, at the pre-hairpin stage, that the inhibitor in red on the right, it's going to undergo its own refolding along the grooves of the spike. And again, by sitting there, it's going to block the refolding that I'm showing you next. And again, we were, we were thrilled that all the work that we had done to create this, this visualization and simulation over the past year is something that could contribute to the, the, the amazing work of, um, of these collaborators. So that's a, a thank you and kudos to them. <laughs> uh, so I, I just want to end by stepping back out and suggesting that you know, for us, visualization is, is an exciting way to communicate the complexities of, of different aspects of science. But I would even encourage all of you to think of it, it's, it's less about the final imagery in many cases, it's more about the process of visualizing things that changes your understanding of the science you're visualizing. And we've experienced this over and over over the years where we'll work with a particular expert and because we're doing a visualization with them, they will have these mini epiphanies about their own data that the visualization process triggered in them. And I just love this, this Max Planck quote, the chief problem in every science is that of endeavoring to arrange and collate the numerous individual observations and details which present themselves in order that they may become part of a comprehensive picture. And certainly, I, I, going back to the work of, of David, David Goodsell, I think one of his paintings is, is an obvious example of, yes, the, the final imagery is engaging and beautiful, but when you realize the amount of work and data collection and integration that goes into creating one of those, I would argue that that's, uh, that's of, at least as of important value. So um, we've done our best to try and engage more and more scientists into our community and to get them to either learn the skills to create their own visualization. So we, we launched a portal called Clarify a few years back. And of course, our, our molecular Maya software is also available on, on Clarify, as well as training uh, tutorials for people who are interested in doing this work. But I also want to end by, by mentioning an incredible organization, the, the, American, uh, the Association of Medical Illustrators, the AMI, um, because it, it really, it's an organization that lives at that intersection of science, art, design. And so if you're interested in, in this type of work, and you may not have the time to actually learn how to do some of this yourself, I would recommend that you find a, a collaborator, uh, through the AMI uh, to really explore what this type of visualization can do for your own research. So thanks again for, for having me today.
Thank you, Gail. That was wonderful. That definitely was a contortionist, uh, uh, very balletic. Um, okay, we are now opening up the Q and A, um, and uh, I know that uh, there were several questions for Abby to begin with because uh, when I was using Schrodinger, I had the same situation with exporting uh, into other. Um, uh, 3D programs uh, such as Maya that uh, Gail was talking about. Um, uh, can you address that uh, for us? Yeah, sure. If you're happy for me to just quickly share the screen, sure. if we have a minute, I can show Absolutely. you. Um, yes. That'll probably be the easiest way to do it. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, yes. great. So I um, So in Maestro here, the best way to export a structure, if you have some a list of structures in your, your entry table or entry list here, you can just right click on the entry you want to export and come down to structures or spreadsheet, depending on what kind of data you would like to export. If you're wanting to export a structure, you have an option then to choose the file type here in this menu. So there's things like a PDB, MOL2, um, if it's a, a you know, a a 2D representation, you might want a smiles file, something like that. So there are a couple of options here. I believe though that the question was more geared towards uh, sort of 3D printing or, or three-dimensional yeah. um, images. So the best way to do that is actually to um, send things to PyMol. And again, I can show you just quickly how to do that. You can come up to the workspace, send um, a particular area. Sorry, I'll just get the menu on my other screen. You can choose say just a selected item or a specific scene from your display um, and send that to PyMol just as long as you have PyMol installed as well, locate that um, and it will open up PyMol for you so that you can then have your visualization. Then within PyMol, you come up to file and there's an option to export images in different file types. So you can see the VRML2 format there, which I believe is something you can then use for Kind of three-dimensional 3D printing, that kind of thing. Um, and again, there's just some different file options in terms of movies. You can export things that way as well. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, just uh, personally, I've used the, I've exported uh, from PyMall, I've exported Collada and brought that into Photoshop. Mm. You know, um, it has Great. its limitations, but yeah. Uh, um, and the, uh, the, the videos are easier to. Explain. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then there was, uh, we had some other uh, questions here. Uh, what molecular biology subjects do you feel are underrepresented, underrepresented in terms of visualization? I guess this is for everybody. Uh, which phenomena would you like to see visualized that haven't yet been? Uh, who would like to jump in and answer that one? Anybody feel like there's something? I, I can start. Okay. Yeah, I, I can start with that. And to me, the biggest challenge we have right now is the stuff that's coming out of cryo EM uh, structure determination that they're giving us truly enormous and wonderful new structures that are breaking everything. <laughs> and so uh, I think, Gail, on your last slide of, of the ribosomes is a perfect example. You, the, the artist of that probably put a ton of work to make those uh, those ribosomes accessible and understandable. And it takes a lot of work to, to make those things readable now. And, and I think that's going to be our big challenge is making that easier yeah. in future. I'll, I'll add to that if I may, because the other amazing thing about CryUAM is not just the size of things, but the fact that we can get a better sense of the multiple states that they live in. And so with that, I would just as a general, and I'm again, I'm biased because of the nature of my talk, but I would say that visualizing the dynamics of things at different scales, not just the, I mean, the, the dynamics in these molecules, of course, exist at, at every level, individual atomic vibrations, side chains, rotations, domains, et cetera, and, and on up. And so I think that looking at those dynamics, representing them, and being careful also not to always to, to depict them 
in a way that implies agency in the way that they move, which is always a challenge, a whole other question. But, you know, just to throw that in there as well, is uh, it, there's a lot of uh, exciting work to be done there. Uh, I remember talking to you, Gail, also about how um, creating these visuals also really deepens the understanding and being able to uh, um, express how to create them is another way of uh, really deeping, uh, deepening the knowledge. So um, I think that's a, a really uh, interest, um, good perspective on it. And, uh, you know, plus for visualizing things. Uh, another question we had was, um, has anyone been approached about working on animated feature films? I, I know there were some Columbia people. Is it Greenspan? Uh, is that Robert would know that? But there are. They. Ha I don't know if anyone in this group has. Has anybody? No. <laughs> I'd love to work on a new Fantastic Voyage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to answer uh, Nikki's question, um, Eton Greenspan. Uh, Eton Greenspan, right? Worked on um, uh, the movie Tangled about um, uh, and particularly modeling hair, the hair in a realistic way, hair that moved. It's been a real challenge for animators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've had members of our team, we, we have members of our team who, you know, I, I call them kind of the closeted scientists because they're, they're actually teaching in Hollywood animation school. So for example, Eric Keller on our team is a, has contributed to, you know, Aquaman and other, other blockbusters, but the stuff he really likes doing uh, as, as the self-described uh, entomology geek that he is, is to animate ants and model insects. And, and um, you know, so I think there, there are some people who are kind of have their feet in both industries. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then there's, do you have a favorite up and coming molecular biology artist? Well, there's a lot of them, so. I'd like to kind of, I'd like to flip that question on its head and say, how do you find work by new artists? I, I, I find that incredibly difficult to find. And I'm, I'm super lucky that, that I have this association with the, the PDB so people can, can find my stuff, but I don't think everybody has that opportunity. And Tal, how do people get to your work? Yeah. Well, this is why we're having this visualizing. This is one of the, this is how uh, this came about, actually, because I posed that very question to myself working at Columbia for 14 years uh, and wondering why, why isn't there a way to get, um, to get these, this, these people together? Because there is a lot out there. Um, yeah. I think in my experience, it's, it's usually completely random, um, which is, <laughs> which is fun in a way, but I mean, I think it would be amazing if there was some, I don't know, resource of people working at the interface, like they're, I mean, just art and science in general. And you can kind of look at that. It's, it's worth mentioning and, and, you know, pointing back to the AMI, but also there, I believe, still four or five programs, and at least in, in North America, that are just unbelievable programs i mean the, the students who come out of these programs if you look at their portfolios it's it's downright depressing in terms of the the level of skill so i find that actually looking at places like uh i mean I, i'm not going to name all four or five so I'll, i forgive me for the others i'll mention my two favorite but university of toronto biomedical communication program is absolutely one of the top in, in my uh, view. Um, Johns Hopkins has an incredible program, I think, in fact, the, the first, um, and, and the others. And, and some of these, again, are, are listed on the AMI, but these are people who, again, are, are duly trained in both the, the visualization artistic methods as well as the background in the science, graduate level uh, experience in the sciences. And so a lot of new talent coming there, um, coming out of, of those places. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't been to their sites in a while, the AMI site. Do, are there galleries there that show off that you can go to for inspiration? There, there's a couple of, you can either go through there. So there's like a, the salon showcase is one of the things. And of course, it goes without saying, places like the AMI have a, an annual meeting. 
that is a wonderful place to if you if you want to really go there. But the other way to do it is to just go to the individual program web pages. They do a typically a really good job, even in the first year of their training, to get all the students to create their own websites and start portfolios. So even as a first year student, you can go browse, you know, a lot of different uh, a lot of different student sites and their and their work. So. Um. I believe that uh, uh, there was a question about David's process. Uh, I guess I guess what is fascinating people is that you uh, you still are doing things freehand um, as opposed to jumping right in with a computer. Uh, but um, do you want to talk a little? You did already talk a little bit about that in the presentation, but anything? yeah, so. So the, the, the interactions and flexibility of proteins are such that it, they're, they're actually incredibly difficult to model. And I mean, Gail's whole process there was an example. He's building really sophisticated specialized tools um, to address that, that one system that he's, he's playing with. Um, and so the, the, just drawing by hand gives me a lot more freedom to to explore those kind of things. Um, I'm hoping the tools like the stuff that Gail's building is going to make it much more possible in the very near future. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and I also, uh, the, the painting process itself, <laughs> as probably yeah. a lot of people in the audience know is, is in itself really satisfying. Well, that's what so, I was gonna ask you. Would you, even if, if you had the tools, would you wanna give up the actual physical drawing by hand? Or would you begin by drawing by hand and then going, uh, maybe importing it into some program? I, I think it's my personal comfort level and interest is going to keep me drawing, is going to keep me with the brushes forever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I can understand that. Um, okay, let's see. Are there any other questions? Is there anything that I've missed here? I think, Nikki, just to go back to the first question um, yes. about visualizations, I was, had a question sort of for David and Gail and everybody. Um, uh, I was wondering if, if you can do animations or visualizations of the, of the scale of bacteria, like some of the things I was showing where it's like a cluster of bacteria and they have different forms of motility. Or they, they, they not only just swim, but they group together and they cluster and they form these rafts and these fractals and stuff. Is it something that you can kind of scale in these softwares, or is it all like at the molecular level if that's what's available right now? It's it's all in how you fudge it. <laughs> so in other words, you can you can depict literally anything, right? You can make anything, but you you start to move away from these kinds of coarse grain there, there's kind of a gradient right of in in the in the realm of simulation to animation so, so one of my slides was showing kind of the more again hardcore molecular dynamic simulations where you you set up all the rules and then you press play and you let the system evolve and it, it's meant to be predictive in its outcome then you start to slide a little bit further on that continuum that that gradient and now you're starting to um steer things so it's still a simulation but you're kind of applying external forces because you you have external knowledge that you want to apply to the system and in some ways save on the computation right but then as you move further and further away from that then you can just animate in other words you can make things do whatever you want them to do and depict them the way you want at any scale it's just that now you're you're well, I would say you have to be particularly careful about what you're depicting. Is it just communicating something you already know is happening? Or is it still kind of a, a hypothesis visualized, which is a little bit different, right? Is it, is it a system that you want to keep changing and evolving to answer questions in a visual form? So I, I don't know, maybe back to you in terms of what do you want to do with it? Do you want to communicate something to another audience? Or do you want to use it as a, as a model in your lab? Yeah, I was thinking in terms of if there was, a, I don't know, some generative way to look at noise and how noise affects maybe these patterns as they grow outwards in a colony. Um, I was wondering if there was just like some hacks, like you said, or uh, ways that you can maybe think of a protein in that software as a bacteria, and then maybe you can 
you know, kind of allow it to simulate from there. I don't know if that, that kind of thing is possible. There are people who have definitely at, at, a, at a different scale, and I'm, I'm just going to post something quickly. Maybe it's in the chat for me to do it, but there, there are certain artists in the, in the industry, and, and this is just one example, who have tried to apply these generative rules, these kind of algorithmic um, modeling uh, kind of organic systems. Uh, and it's been really interesting to see how sometimes they come close to things you observe, for example, during, during development, uh, during, you know, um, development of structures uh, at the embryonic stage, et cetera. But again, I think that the devil is in the details that the specific rules they're using to generate this art, I think there's a lot of potential there actually for collaborations to, to drive their methods with real data, perhaps would, would lead to some really interesting things. The thing I'm seeing in the field as well from the modeling side is that you can go to the literature and find really effective modeling tools, uh, prediction tools at any one of those levels, all the way from bacterial colonies down to individual proteins. Um, but people tend to stay in their silos. Uh, and so there's more of a move now of people coming up with multi-resolution methods that try to link the methods that are used at each of those different scale levels, which is tricky, both in terms of modeling and in terms of visualization. You know, having a visualization ways that you can smoothly transition between different scale levels. So it, it's very much in, in progress now. Interesting, thanks. There was, um, there's one uh, uh, a question here that says the uh, proteins are both structural and motile. So how difficult is to model movement of a motile protein? Does anybody have an answer for that one? I showed movement, so I guess I should take that one. So motile uh, I, I was... word, I usually tend to think of applying more to cells, <laughs> whereas proteins are flexible and, and have, have these different levels of flexibilities, not only in terms of the, the scale, the, 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 the physical scale with which they move, but also on different temporal scales. So it's this kind of really rich and, and complicated set of motions. So I'm not sure actually about the question. In other words, yes, it is hard to show proteins moving depending on what you're trying to show. If it's specifically a protein involved in motility, I don't know that it's harder than in a sense, any other protein. In other words, and you know, I don't know, does that even address the question at all? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, I think, yeah, I think it does. I think that, you know, um, yeah. Uh, uh, there is one other thing too. Um, uh, someone was mentioning about uh, um, understanding the level of difficulty of art and also the importance of art for effective communication of science. So that is something that we may want to uh, touch on real quickly before we we end, um, uh, because it is getting increasingly more and more important to uh, visualize science. Um, would anybody like to touch on that? I, <laughs> I'm happy to jump in again, just because it's an area of great interest. In other words, I, I think so. So I'll make a plug for something we're, we're doing, which I mentioned before, this visibly network, which is that there are these amazing visualizations out there, but it's difficult for almost any of us watching them to know what went into making them. Right, so you're you're lucky if at the end of a movie you'll have a few PDB IDs sprinkled. But so what what we've been thinking about, and we're not the only ones, you know, is there some sort of an annotation system that can be used that doesn't get in the way of the visualization and, and what it's meant to do? And again, visualizations are used for all kinds of different things for different audiences, so that there's a broad spectrum there. But could there be a visual a, a, an annotation system that 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 kind of travels with the visualization? that allows you to get at all of the, not only the data, but I would argue just as importantly, the design decisions that drove the creators to depict something in a particular way. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But I think that would have all kinds of applications, not only in the realm of uh, education, classrooms, but also in scientists uh, kind of looking at each other's visualizations and understanding how much data actually went into that, you know? 
which is a question I got from David a couple of weeks ago and inspired me to talk more about the simulation methods today because it's not clear exactly what some of these tools do. And so I think if we can if we can add another layer of information of metadata in a sense on top of the visualizations in the same way that people reference in, the, in their scientific papers, right? That's, that's a no-brainer, everyone does that. Why don't visualizations have more of that? That's, that's a good idea, actually. Um, uh, we, there are more and more uh, programs being developed in ways to aid people uh, uh, on all levels, on all skill levels in doing this. Uh, so um, it seems to me like it's, the field is just growing in that area. Um, all right, I think we are ready to wrap up. We're actually three minutes over. So <laughs> uh, does anybody have any uh, anything else they would like to say before we all go? And, uh, and I want to thank you all for coming and, and doing this. Um, uh, my plan is to keep doing these, um, you know, semi regularly over the courses of the semesters. Uh, and um, I, I, it looks like we are all going to be back on campus in September, hopefully, but um, um, so uh, they may be in person. The uh, next one's coming up. Uh, all right. Well, so, thank you. Uh, so yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki and the panelists for uh, uh, stimulating and a fascinating um, uh, workshop today. Uh, audience, please stay online. Uh, the seminar will close but the uh, audience survey will come up next and we really very much want to uh, hear from you, particularly your suggestions for topics for future workshops. Thank you again, see you soon. Thank you.